Hello, this is part two of chapter three. In this part two, I'm gonna go in detail of some of the topics from chapter three, aggregate production and productivity. So the two topics that I'm gonna go deep in are the Cobb-Douglas function, and specifically I'll cover what is alpha. Second, I'll cover what is, why does it, uh, why do we say that it has constant returns to scale? And why do we say that the Cobb-Douglas function has diminishing marginal product? And second, I'll go in the depth of how oil shocks uh, has a direct correlation with uh, stock markets uh, plummeting. Most of these topics I have covered uh, in the part one or the original video, but this is in more depth and also clarifies some of the things that I missed covering in the first video. So let's get into it, yeah? So we know the Cobb-Douglas production function is y is f of k l, it's a function, output y is a function of capital and labor. Uh, and if we expand that further, we've seen in part one that it's y is a k times k raised alpha l raised one minus alpha, where a is productivity and k is capital again, l is labor, alpha is the percentage share of capital. And for most countries, this is fixed ratio. And that's a longer video in itself as to how did we get 0.3 for the United States. But assume that this stays stable. Alpha is a percentage share of capital. What does this mean? This basically shares what is the percentage of income coming from capital. And we know that L is one race, one L, L, L is one minus alpha. That's the power that L has. So if this is 0.3 or 30%, then L is 100 minus 0.3 or 70%. So if this was 0.4, this would be 0.6, right? So capital and labor, they complement. And it basically says, what is the percentage contribution of income or output, right, that the country has from capital. Uh, we can show this in much more detail, but that's again a separate topic. But in a sense to understand that alpha is a percentage contribution of capital to income or output. Now, why do we say that the cobb douglas function has constant returns to scale? So let's take an example. Let's take an example where y is a k time k raised to 0 0.3, l raised to 0.7. And let's say we increase the capital and the labor by a factor of b. So we say we replace k by bk and l by bl. So we are raising, scaling this function by b. So if we substitute this over here, we will see that y prime is a b k raised to 0.3 b l raised to 0.7 and if we factor this continuous we will see that this goes this uh, can be written and derived as uh, um, a b raised to 0.3 and then b raised to 0.7 k raised to 0 0.3 0.07 so we can con derive this and then eventually this becomes a b k raised to 0.3 l raised to 0 seven, which is nothing but b times y. So y prime is nothing but b times y, which basically proves that uh, this has constant return to scale. So then let's also look at why do we say that the Cobb-Douglas function has diminishing marginal product of capital and diminishing marginal product of labor. So let's assume that uh, we are talking about the United States. Let's assume again 100,000, 100 million workers. So L equals 100 million. So if we substitute that in the in this equation we get y equals a k raised to 0.300 million raised to 0.7 so now this 100 million raised to 0.7 times a is nothing but a constant so we can write this as uh, b right let us assume b is this constant and let's assume that the value of b is 0.5 we can easily calculate this if we substitute a and if we multiply this then we'll get some number but in a sense, let's assume that this is a constant and let's assume that constant is 0.5 to understand why do we say it has diminishing marginal product of capital and labor. So basically the function then gets reduced to y equals 0.5 or b k raised to 0.3.
if we plot this equation with these two variables, y equals 0 0.5, k is 2.3, this plot looks like this. It's an upward sloping curve. And to, to show this, I've, I've, you can do this easily. Uh, you can go to mathway.com and then just say, hey, plot this graph for me, y equals 0 0.5, x raised to 0.3, right? I've written five here, but basically it's an upward sloping curve, right? An upward sloping curve has two characteristics, uh, but it looks like this, where the initial slope is much higher and the slope reduces, reduces, reduces over time. So what does this mean? This means that if we go for, if we add one unit of capital from zero to one, right? We add one unit of capital, we get in the output three units, right? this section A is basically saying I'm going to add one unit of capital, I get three output units. But I again add one more unit from one to two, then I only get one unit of capital. You see, this this slope is reducing, right? The slope is reducing, it's getting smaller and smaller. So what does that mean? If you keep adding more capital, output will not increase in the same level as it increased, let's say, in the first unit it will actually reduce from the first unit. So that's why we are saying it diminishes. The returns diminish as you add more capital. Same is true for labor, because like, like what we did here, we, uh, we substituted labor, we can also substitute uh, capital. Like let's say India, we'd substitute K and then the labor is a large amount. So same graph we will get. That's why we say this has a uh, diminishing marginal product of capital. So now let's get into an important final topic, which is how do we say that the oil shock or negative supply shock has impact on the stock markets, right? So most recently we're going through this. We're going through this. We see that uh, the oil prices, uh, especially after the Russian invasion, has, has just gone up, right? It has gone up uh, price per barrel. This is what it has shown. It's gone up uh, significantly, right? Uh, in uh, January 22, so this is between 60 and 80 dollars and now it's close to 100, 100, uh, 100 and 120 dollars. So Russia, the oil exports, right, 8 percent. So that's another thing to keep in mind, like where is, how much is the percentage that we're talking about for the overall global petroleum production? It's 8 percent. It's 8 percent is now in jeopardy because no one wants uh, to buy that oil. That's, that's not true actually. They have lots of uh, uh, oil that they um, they have uh, countries that are willing to take from them, but let's assume that this was the negative shock. I'm just taking an example here that all of a sudden the world has less oil by eight to 10 percent, right? If the oil price uh, goes up as, as, as there's a shock, which we have seen in data empirically, but let's try to derive this based on learnings from this chapter, right? So we know that the negative supply shock basically says reduction in output uh, or the supply of oil. When that happens, the price goes up because there's less uh, supply, but the demand continues to be high. So the price of that commodity goes up, so which we have seen price of oil goes up, right? When price of oil goes up, the marginal product of capital, which is what we've covered, and marginal product of labor, this goes down. What's an intuition behind this? We have seen that uh, in, in the part one, that MPK curve shifts down, right? Because uh, the same amount, the same one dollar that let's say could get uh, one barrel of oil, it's not true, but let's say one dollar got one barrel, now one dollar is going to get you 0.5 barrel, right? So the graph of MPK, marginal product capital, goes down. What does that mean? Things just got more expensive. The same dollar now can buy less oil. So that is marginal product of capital. Similarly, marginal product of labor goes down, right? So we saw when that happens, this curve shifts down. When this curve shifts down, we know that the demand curve also shifts leftwards, right? There is a, there's a, there's a, there's going to be less demand for, uh, that's going to be less demand, right? Why, why is this going to be less demand? Because the demand curve shifts down, right? Why is the demand curve shifting down? We know that uh, rental cost of capital and wages have gone down, right? We saw that here, right? We know that uh, when that happens, uh, when the demand curve shifts down, the wages, the real wages goes down, right? Because the same amount of capital now all of a sudden can get you less 
amount of uh, um, less amount of output because you can buy less right we just saw this you can buy less for the same dollar and so your capital and your labor you will get less because things are more expensive you'll get less and so what happens is the demand goes down but the supply is constant in the short term so when the supply is constant the demand curve goes down so what happens is wages goes down and rental cost of capital goes down right we've seen this in part one but basically when there is a shock uh, the demand curve shifts down because there is less demand for um, that uh, people or for that resources because there's there's less flexibility in the short term for that supply right and and because the same dollar can buy you less amount than what it used to before because the prices have gone up so when when the wages go down and when the rental cost of capital goes down that has an impact on the stock prices how so when the rental cap rental rate of capital goes down the stock prices goes down because rental rate of capital is basically what is the yield that you expect from uh, these companies that you're investing in that's the rental yield so if the rental yield goes down, which basically says the future cash flows of this company is going to go down, that's what is you get as rent from investing in company. So when the future cash flows goes down, we know from time value of money that, hey, we're going to discount this cash flows um, and we get the stock price. So stock price depends on the discounted cash flows of uh, future cash flows of the company. The future cash flows of the companies will go down as the rental yield goes out, the expectation goes down, um, and so the stock price collapses. So that's the relationship, right? So time value of money, there's several other factors uh, apart from the rental yield going down. Think about this, the companies that have uh, a large amount of future cash flows in a, in a very distant future, they'll go down much more because you're gonna discount them much higher. There's inflation that also impacts this in a pretty big way for stock markets, but this is a big factor. Rental yields going down is a big factor that causes the stock prices to collapse. When inflation goes down as well, the discount rate goes up, uh, so the stock price again collapses because the discounted cash flow of that uh, stock uh, is going to go down. So these are some of the details of a little bit of in-depth as to why the stock market collapses and we understood a little bit more about the Cobb Douglas function um, from, from this deep dive, right? As to what is alpha, what is constant return to scale, what's diminishing margin of product? Why do we say it's uh, both it is diminishing for capital and labor? And how the oil shock has an impact on the stock market? Uh, we'll learn in future as well in many other videos in this subject that uh, not just oil prices, inflation, interest rate, it has a, all of those variables also impact the stock market. But this is one major variable. And you've seen through data in the past that the past uh, oil shocks has led to stock markets uh, collapsing. And we're seeing that even right now. In uh, May 2022, um, oil prices, oil shock has a huge part as well on top of other factors. Thanks.